I was going to buy a plane, a small plane to fly in, and I met a man named Phil Driscoll, who is a pilot and owned, owned several planes. I said, um, do you know what type of pilot should I have? And he said to me, find one who has survived crashes. And I thought he was joking. He said, no, I'm not joking. He said, if you will find a man who has survived engine failure and crashes, you will probably survive anything bad that happens because he's been through it. Then, a uh, little military thing here, on following leaders. Never follow leaders who do not have battle scars because the only teaching they can provide for you is from a book. Uh, no, I've been changed. Uh. <laughs> Find people, and Miss Karen is one. This man is one. We have been to, we've been through battles together and come through. And find the people, the leaders, who have been through the battles, who have the scars to prove it, and are still standing. Because what they can teach you is how to go through it and still stand. Yeah, all five of you, bless you. For that amen. And so you're in a house of a family and, and people, this ramp ministry that has been through battles. And we've been through every one of them with them. And we have watched them stand and trust God and watch God come through. And uh, the one thing you don't want to mess with is somebody who's in God's perfect will. Because God will put on his boxing gloves. I better shut up. Hmm. All right. I was uh, just the other day, had a whole, whole different message I was going to preach. Some of you wanted me to do that whole Jewish wedding thing. And I, I think Miss Karen thought maybe I was going to do that tonight. But I don't want to disappoint anyone. But I feel like that I need to share with you what God has taught me in 46 years of ministry on how to find the will of God. Because there is so much misconception about this whole phrase, the will of God, and what it is, etc. So Romans chapter 12, if you want to... Go on your phone, <laughs> just to say open your Bible. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. And I want to read this to you, and then I'm going to give you a very important verse in a moment that is going to be applied from a different perspective than perhaps you've heard before, and we're going to break this down. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, what you do for him is connected to being pure in mind, heart, body, spirit. What you do for him is connected. Your success, we would say. I hate to use that word. It's so secular. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, watch this now, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We've read that. We have read over that. And he reveals to you three levels or three positions of being in God's will. Everyone in this room wants to say, I want the perfect will of God. And I'm going to give you the Greek word in a moment to tell you that the word perfect is not what you're thinking it is. That the word perfect may not be what you have perceived it to be the whole time you have been in ramp school of ministry. Five misconceptions, however, that I have learned in 40, almost 46 years of ministry concerning the will of God. Number one, people believe that the will of God will be done no matter what you do. In other words, it's going to happen. We're just going to go with the flow. So who cares? Just live life to its fullest and Whatever will be, will be, and we'll end up there eventually. Don't tell Jonah that. Because God sent him on a submarine ride. And can I give you a nugget from Jonah? Oh, here we go on the rabbit trails. Lord, I'll be here all night long. If you go to the book of Jonah, this is something you'll discover. And I'll let you dig this out, do a little bit of Hebrew word studies. The reason Jesus compared his death and resurrection to as it, Jonah and the fish was you may not know this, but Jonah actually drowned in the sea. 
Jonah was not alive in that fish's belly for three days. He drowned. He tells you in the book of Jonah the seaweeds were wrapped around his head. He tells you in the book of Jonah that his spirit departed from his body. He tells you in the book of Jonah that he went down to the gates of hell. Paradise and hell at one time were located under the earth before the crucifixion of Jesus. Then he tells you that he prayed as he was fainting inside the fish. The fi God sent the fish, in other, in other words, God sent the fish to swallow him, watch, to preserve his body from the sharks and the other animals that would have eaten him alive. So he was revived after three days. He literally came back from the dead after three days. Now, you know, Nineveh's a three days journey and he makes it in one day. You would too if you'd been to hell and back. I mean, really, if you'd been through what this man went through. So to say, see, in other words, he got to the place where God wanted him, but because of his resistance, he created a situation of hardship for himself that it was not necessary for him to go through. Is it, can I ask you a question? Has anybody ever wanted to know why Jonah did not want to go preach to those folks? Can I tell you the reason why? The Assyrians... Were the, tri were the, were the, were the, the Assyrian nation was the nation that took the ten tribes of Israel captive. He, Nineveh was their capital. Jonah didn't want them folks to repent. He wanted God to kill all of them. All right? And so he goes and says, I've got to go over there and prophesy that God's going to destroy them. So he's going with the intent thinking God's going to kill them all. He didn't think they were going to repent. Watch this. They repent and he gets mad. Do you know why he gets mad? Because the Jewish rabbis say that he now had his reputation on the line. That he had said to the prophets, I'm going here to tell them they're going to be destroyed. Now they're not going to be destroyed. It's going to make me look like a false prophet. Wow. Wow. And so he runs, read in your Bible, to the east. Remember the gourd dries up and he goes eastward. And Jewish sources say he spent a few years in the east. He wouldn't even go back to Israel because he thought they were going to say, you, you're a false prophet, man. You told us this and you told us that. Oh, help me preach somebody. How many Jonas are in the house tonight? Come on. So my point is to say that no matter what we do, we're going to end up in the will of God. Okay, you pray, you might, you could, maybe you will, but you're going to make it harder on yourself if you don't seek God and pursue after it on a consistent basis. Number two, that was too long. Let's see if we can get these, do these quicker. Number two, the will of God is a one-time arrival point. In other words, if I marry the right person and we go to the right place, voila, now we're in the will of God. I want to tell you, having been there, that the will of God is never a one-time arrival point. It is arrival points, plural. It is progressive. Now, many of you are asking God to open a door, but you're wanting a big door to open. Rule number one of ministry, God never opens a big door till you go th through the little one first. And the reason God never opens the big door unless you go through the little one first is God wants to see if you can be faithful in another man's stuff. If you can be faithful in the little things. Because remember what he said? If you're faithful in the little things, then what do I do? I make you ruler over many things. And even in the parables, he talks about if you can be faithful over somebody else's stuff, then I can give you your own stuff to be faithful over. So the will of God is not a, if I get the right person, meet the right people, marry the right person, live in the right place, man, this is going to be it. I will be in the will of God. Yes, but then there will be somewhere another assignment. And then you will have to move to another part of the will of God. Then later on, there's another level of that. And you'll move to the next part. And the third, that's, So it's a misconception to think it's just a one-time point and I've arrived. Number three, the will of God is going to make things easier. Now, how many people have I heard say, well, if I can just find the will of God, all my troubles are going to be over. I got news for you, baby. When you find the will of God, hell's going to break loose. And I'm going to explain to you why trouble breaks loose many times when you find the will of God. Because once you find the will of the Father, you have a threat assessment that the enemy has made that now you're about to do what you were created to do, what you were born to do, what God's purpose is. And the enemy says, oh my, we got trouble in the camp now because they have now found the place with the right place, the right people at the right time. So let us create a situation in their life to try to pull them away, cause them to become discouraged, cause them to 
want to give up. But I want to tell you, the great thing about it is this. Even though that you find it and you have to get in the middle of the battle when you're there, do you understand that you've got the favor of God with you? And you can go anywhere with the favor of God and come out on top when it's all said and done. You can go through the war and have the favor and win the war. You can go through the battle with the favor and you can win the battle. You can go through the sickness with the favor of God and come out of the hospital saying you couldn't kill me, devil, because you don't have the keys of death and hell anymore. Jesus has raised me up off my deathbed to do something for him. Fourth thing you need to know is this. (laughs) The fourth misconception is if I'm in the will of God, I will have less struggle. Well, well, well. Don't tell Jesus that when for 40 days he's on a mountain being tempted by the devil who's questioning whether or not he's the son of God. Don't tell Jesus that when he's in the garden of Gethsemane about to do the will of God and his sweat is becoming his great drops of blood. He's questioning, can he go through with this? The God has already told him 12 legions of angel, one legion of 6,000, 12 legions of 72,000. One angel can kill 185,000 men. That means 12 legions of angels, angels could kill 16 billion people and there's only been 8 billion people living on the planet right now. That means there's enough angels that are are in heaven that could come right now. The same legions that Jesus had, which was 72,000, that could wipe out the entire planet. But all they have to do is sweep their wings across the globe. And Jesus knew that he could do that. He knew that all he had to do was call. So my point is he is struggling to do what he came to do. Because his flesh knew the pain that was going to have to endure. So is it true that you will have less struggle when you're in the will of God? No. You will continue to struggle. I was thinking the other, just a moment ago about something. And I preached a message uh, many years ago just called temptation. Just the, just the word, temptation. And I said, I've got good news and bad news. Who wants the good news first? Okay. This is where you participate. Who wants the good news first? Your temptation is going to end. Who wants the bad news now? When you die. (laughs) So the good news is, one day you won't have to put up with the devil anymore. One day you won't have to be tempted anymore. But the bad news is you got to get out of this body before you can do it. Okay. Now, so I want to say this to you. That number five is this. I will have less attacks from Satan If I am in the will of God, because I will have more favor with God. Now, there is a level of the favor of the Lord that can prevent attacks or can reveal things before they come. But there is also a grace level. Paul was given. Now, Paul, look, how many believe Paul, how many believe Paul was in the will of God? Would you raise your hand if you believe? You know, this is a guy that wrote, four, if we take Hebrews, wrote 14 books of the New Testament. Uh, this is a guy that caught, got caught up in the third heaven. This is, this, is, this is a fellow that could just cast out devils in the middle of town. He, you know, I mean, this guy's amazing. This is one of the greatest men of God to ever walk in shoe leather. And the apostle Paul is given a thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12, a messenger of Satan. That Greek word is angel, an angel of Satan, to buffet him. You look up the word buffet. It's the same word where they slapped Jesus on the cheek when they were uh, spitting up on him and they pulled, they plucked his, you know, plucked his hair and all that. The, the prophecy says that, and uh, that's the same Greek word there, kalafizo, and it means to buffet. It, what it means is to deal one blow up there after the other. It means to, if you want to get to the original classical Greek, it was a boxing match in a ring with two opponents, and one clips a guy right on the side of the ear enough to hurt him a little bit, knock him off balance. When he gets back up, no sooner does he get his balance, bam, he gets hit again. No sooner does he get his balance, bam, he gets hit again. That's the word buffet in Greek that Paul said. Messenger of Satan, thorn in my flesh to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. My point is simply this, that the apostle Paul made it clear that he had these attacks. But let me tell you what he said. He said, I besought the Lord three times that this thing would depart from me. Three times. But then God spoke to me and said, 
My grace is sufficient for you. My strength will be made perfect in weakness. I just like to throw this out there at you. Uh, if you'll go sometime to the book of Acts, the very last chapter of the book of Acts is the only book of the New Testament that has no conclusion to it. It does not end with peace, peace, grace, and peace. You know, uh, grace and peace is a peace is, is a Hebrew greeting. Grace is a Greek greeting. That's why Paul wrote grace and peace when he wrote his letters. But if you'll go back over there and get to looking at it, it just ends with Paul in Rome. It just stops. I mean, you go, from, you go from Matthew, Mark, Luke, then Luke picks up the book of Acts and continues to write from the end of his gospel of Luke into the history of the, of the, of the, of the early church. But why doesn't it end? It doesn't end. And if you go to that, because I used to say to the Lord, it's not fair. Here's Paul. He goes through all these places, 22 things, 2 Corinthians 12, that he went through being in God's will, beat up, shipwrecked, uh, night and day in the sea, beaten with rods, stoned and left for dead in the book of Acts in the city of Lystra. How come you couldn't have given this guy, give him a break? And when you go to the book of Acts and you read, I think it's maybe from the NIV, it says that he went to Rome and was in his own hired house for two years no man hindering him oh that'll make somebody shout there so in other words he got to the point to the right place with the Gentile people in Rome where he was the man and only when Nero tried to burn Rome down and blame it on Paul did trouble break out for Paul and that's when his life ended he had peace he was not hindered he welcomed all that came to him because he was a Roman citizen living in Rome and he had the freedom to do that so my point is even though he had a thorn most of his life God gave him relief so watch this being in God's will you will at times feel as though that you have just a thorn that just keeps attacking you but just like the apostle Paul, I want to share this with you as encouragement. God will give you seasons of breakthrough and seasons of relief because even when Satan was tempting Jesus, if you go to Luke's gospel, it says that Satan left him for a season. So in other words, attacks are seasonal. They come and they go. If you can survive whatever you're dealing with and make it through the season, you'll get relief. I promise you that if you'll follow through and do the right thing. All right, is everybody still here? Say, I am still here. All right, let's go to this verse right here, back to Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2. Now we're going to do the teaching. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind that you may prove what is that, what is that good. Everybody say good. good. Acceptable. Would you say acceptable? acceptable? And perfect will of God. Say perfect. perfect. Not a person in this room that's ever been connected to ministry that does not say to themselves, I just want the perfect will of God. How many of you have prayed? You should be praying this, but how many of you have prayed, I want God's perfect will in my life? Raise your hand and hold it, hold it up real high if you've ever prayed that. Let me see. Hold it up real high. Wave it this way. Okay, that's about everyone here, and that's absolutely good teaching. You should be praying for that. However, let us take a look at three levels because not everything is necessarily the perfect will. There are some things that are the acceptable will. And there are some things that's the good will. Good will, that's a company, isn't it? So there's, there, there are, now notice, notice in God, in his will, nothing's bad. It's either good, accepted, and acceptable, or perfect. And actually, this is really a process. Now, let me, let me just do a few word studies. And sometimes I'll give you the word in, in, a, in a younger class. It's not as, as significant to know the word and how to pronounce it and all that. But good in the Greek, this particular word means something beneficial, something with virtue. Something beneficial or something with virtue, okay? So the good will of God is something that is beneficial, something that is a blessing. Something that has virtue, has good, good, good outcome to it. All right. The second level is the acceptable will of God. And the acceptable is well-pleasing or agreeable. So God looks at it and says, you know what? I like that. I like what you're doing. I like that you're following me. So he allows you. Now, we're going, look, we're going to get deep in a minute. He allows you to do something that you want to do. And says, I'll accept that. Can I, now, we're going to tell some crazy stories, so y'all just need to get ready for this tonight. My wife and I went to a University of Alabama football game, Roll Tide, for those of you that believe that. 
And, uh, and it was with Georgia. And we went to the Georgia bookstore at the University of Georgia, and there was a book. I wish I'd have, if I'd have known I was going to tell this, I'd have brought the book with me. And it's called Treasure. And up in the corner it said, if you can solve this puzzle, there's a gold horse with a deposit box key in its belly buried in the continental United States and a place open to the public 24 hours a day. And if you find it and turn it in and tell us how you solved the clues, you'll get $500,000. How many of you in 1986 would not like to have had $500,000? That's $25,000 a year for 20 years, according to the book. Raise your hand if that would have been interesting to you. Okay. Well, I'm a puzzle guy. So I sat through the whole game, and the game's going on, and I, and I, and I, and I broke the first part of the, of the puzzle. I'm serious. And she'll tell you, I literally broke, and I told her by 6 in the morning, stayed up all night, I told her, it's in the state of Oregon. It's on Crater Lake State Park on a place called Wizard Island, but I've got to find where. Long story made short, I worked on that puzzle and went to Crater Island, uh, Wizard Island State Park in uh, Oregon with Keith Dudley, who is a friend of mine. You might remember Brother Keith. He was a singer. We go out there, and I go take a boat. I go out there, and I start to see all the clues. There's the lodge. There's this. There's Phantom Ship. It talks about the ghost boat and all. There's the Phantom Ship, which is a rock formation, actually. And I get up, and I go on the wrong side, and I read the book the next day, and it, she's walking a path, and it just says, not right. Like, she, like, it's not right to do this, but it meant don't go right. I said, I went right. I'm not supposed to go right. So I went down into this little extinct volcano that was not a volcano. It was, it was filled up, and there was a rock with a date on it, and when the sun hit at a certain time, the rock pointed to where the horse was buried. So I went to the other side and came into a path. Long story, I'm making this real short. This is the funnest story to tell, if you can see the pictures. And there is a tree shaped like a horseshoe. I'm telling you, it's, as long, it's, it's like this. Like these, these, it's shaped like a horseshoe. It's in the ground. And the cover of the book is a carousel, a girl in front of a carousel. And there is a root of that tree that looks like the horse's head on a carousel. It looks just like a horse's head. And it's, I'm freaking out. I said, Keith, there's the, that's the carousel. It's the root. Oh, my God, it's shaped like a horseshoe. And I looked, and I removed these little red vines, and there are three granite rocks that are not native to that area, three of them. And there are, anyway, I don't want to give all the clues away. So I, I, I take the granite rocks out, and I know, he says, oh, my God, this is it. So I, I start digging. I had a trowel with me. I had enough faith to take a little trowel with me to dig. You understand? I felt, I felt I was going to find it. Okay. Battery is running low. Yeah, we knew that was going to happen. Okay. So long story made short, I found the spot, but I was a foot short of digging it up. The story, the, in the book, it had a rag doll with two black shoes. That's two feet. And I dug a foot, and it was two feet deep. All right. I asked the Lord. I said, it's very obviously, Father, that you could have helped me to find this, and I want to know why you didn't help me find it. He said, because it's something you wanted to do and you wanted to have fun with, so I allowed you to do it. I accepted you in doing it to prove you could do it because you wanted to prove you could solve it. I said, it sure would have been fun to find the horse. And he spoke to me through a song that was on the radio, and he said, the horse ain't your source. my lesson right there. But my point is, now was it the will of God that I find the horse? Obviously not or I would, have, I would have got it. So I can't say it was. But yet it was an acceptable thing and it was a lot of fun for me. It took a lot of stress off of me. Pam remembers it. We had a, we had a ball with that thing even though I didn't find it. But then there's the perfect will of God. What is the perfect will of God? The word perfect in Greek means complete. Watch this. Complete. It comes from a Greek root word, teleos, which means an end point or the point of completing something. Now, this adds an entire different, if I can use the word twist, to what is the will of God? What is it? Is the will of God where everything is perfection? See, we see perfect will of God as, as we're happy, uh, everything is perfect, everything is going great, so I must be in the will of God. We've got a misconception. It actually means to complete that which he has told you to do. It's just real simple. We've complicated it. We've heard everybody's story. We've read everybody's book. I struggled and I finally found the perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is when you are doing that that completes the thing that the Lord has put in your heart. Okay? Stay, now keep that thought. So what is good? In Luke chapter four and verse uh, chapter ten and verse forty, 
Mary and Martha are in a house together. Mary is worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Martha is cooking, and she is upset because Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, can I tell you something? Somebody's got to cook the meal for these people, folks. We always, we're always fussing at Martha. She should have been worshiping. If she'd been worshiping, there'd been no dinner. I mean, there's a brother back here. Instead of being in church, he's back there cooking tonight. That's his ministry. Hello, somebody. Just like the worship team. He's got a ministry. That's a ministry to him. Ah, yeah, Lord. But here's the point. What is the good? He, this is what Jesus said. Mary had chosen the good part. In other words, Martha, we know you got to cook. See, he wasn't rebuking her for cooking. Look at it again. He said, you are cumbered with too many cares. It's not your problem with cooking. Your problem is, oh, you're so stressed out with who's going to serve and how many we got. Just cook and listen to me teach and have a good time. Quit getting so stinking stressed out. Oh, that'll preach right there, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he rebuked her for being cumbered with cares. Let me talk about something good. Okay, ready? There are people that have a feeding center to feed the poor, and they do it on a consistent basis, and that is their ministry, ministry of feeding the poor. Matthew 25, one of the gateways into the kingdom is taking care of the poor, feeding them, clothing them, and taking care of prisoners and visiting them. We know that from Matthew 25. You want to get to the kingdom? Those are the works that you're involved with that are good. If I say good works. The Bible talks about that they will see the good works of your Father which is in heaven. Good works. So in other words, these are good things that we do. So therefore, you don't have to have or own a feeding center to be in the will of God. All you've got to do is occasionally feed the poor and help people when you can. And you are in the good will of God. Because you are doing the good thing. So in other words, it's not like, oh, that's my assignment. It might not be your assignment. But we're told, I send books free to prisoners all across the United States. Been doing it for years. Cost me tens of thousands of dollars. We pay for the postage, we pay for the book, and we send it in. You know why? Because Jesus said, visit them. I can't visit all these prisons, but my books can. Hello, somebody. So what am I doing? I'm doing the good thing. So there are things you do that it's not necessarily the completed will of God for my life. But it's a good thing that God honors that helps you to be a part of the kingdom of God. Let me, let me give an example. Listen to this verse right here. Certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, and, uh, uh, and Mary, I'm sorry, and Mary Magdalene, of whom he cast out seven devils, Johanna the wife of Husa, Herod Stewart, and Susanna, and many others ministered to Jesus of their substance, Luke chapter 8, verses 2 through, uh, through 3. Herod's Stewart got 10% of every building program, and Herod the Great was one of the greatest builders in the Roman Empire time. Susanna, the woman in this text, is believed to be the wife of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea who let Jesus borrow his tomb. Joseph, who according to early church fathers, was a tin trader from Britain, Britain, a very great wealth. And so these men were not in the inner circle of praying with people there when he multiplied the bread and fish. What are they doing? They are behind the scenes in the business part. Did you know Nicodemus owned the Garden of Gethsemane? That's where he went when he met Jesus to pray. The Garden of Nicodemus, according to some historians, owned the Garden of Gethsemane. Joseph owned the tomb, which was located somewhere in the garden. They were Sanhedrin members. They were two notable men, two of the wealthiest men in the city, and they did not. They were secret disciples. But let me tell you something: had it not been for no Nick at night, Jesus would have had nowhere to pray. Huh? Had it not been, had it not been for Joseph, they would have taken the body off the cross, wrapped it up, and taken it down to Gehenna, where there was a fire. It was the garbage dump and they'd have burnt the body of Jesus because of blasphemy and his body would have disappeared. There would have never been any evidence of the scars in his hands but because Joseph had a tomb in the middle of a garden somewhere near Nick at Night's place. Can I tell you that they were responsible for making sure that that body was not destroyed. God had to have some secret guys that nobody paid much attention to that were in the backside doing the good thing. Mm. What's the acceptable? The acceptable is the permissible. That means God will say to you, okay, I'll let you do that. I'll let you do that. And I can make it work. 
Can I give you one example? This is a little bit maybe a fleshly example. But there have been young girls that have gotten pregnant out of wedlock. And they have chosen after talking to the young man to say, let's make this work. I feel like you love me. You feel like you love, I love you. We love each other. Let's make it work. And there have been people that have absolutely made it work. Okay? Now, was it the will of God for them to, to have their relationship for her to get pregnant? Probably not that timing, of course, because you should be married before you do that. But can God take that and still use that? Dear God, God can take anything that's, that seems to be negative and make it work eventually. And so there have been people that have been touched by God. Their families are touched. These, the kids are older now. They've got grandbabies coming. And they made it work because God says, well, you know what? If you, feel, if you will do this, if you'll try to do the right thing, if you'll try to do the good thing, if you'll try to work this out based on what I have told you, even though there was a mess up here, I can bless the child. Someone said, well, prove that in the Bible. I'm glad you told me. When David got Bathsheba pregnant, that baby died because that baby was under the judgment of the Lord. Read your Bible. But then mm -hmm, Bathsheba, she's in the Bible, has a baby by the name of Solomon. And the Bible says, Solomon whom God loved. And God made her baby, Bathsheba's baby, several children later, the king that took King David's place. Which goes to show you that the mercy and the grace of God does not work on the same level as men's so-called mercy and men's so-called grace. Because God took us in God. You think about what I'm saying. God took the woman that had messed up the whole thing. God took the man that had messed up the whole thing. And yes, he lost four sons. And yes, he experienced loss. And yes, Yes, he experienced judgment, but in the end, God took his son from the same woman and said, that's the boy I'm going to raise up because I promised David that I would have a seed on his throne forever. Somebody ought to give God praise. God says, it's acceptable to me if you will follow me to do this. It'll, it'll be the right thing. Now, let me just talk to you here for a moment, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to make a statement that is going to sound a little bit controversial. and This will probably be the one thing if Miss Karen were here, she would look at me and just give me the eye. How many of you know Miss Karen has the eye? Miss Karen has a fake smile when you're preaching. <laughs> if she was, I'm only teasing her. She's like my sister. I'm only teasing her. Uh, let, let me talk to you for a moment because this, this may go out. Let me just look at my notes make sure I don't uh, miss this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you something most preachers would never say to you as single kids. Young people, not kids. I have to say kids. I believe there are up to three people in the earth you could marry. Not three at one time. I do believe that there are people that you could meet who are saved and spirit-filled and God will say, you know what? They're a good person. You fall in love with them. You have feelings for them. You feel like you can make it work. And maybe they're not the best choice. Maybe God could say there is probably a better choice that will open up more doors or you will have more opportunities. But you love each other. I'll accept I, that, it, and they're good, and you can make it work. Now, you will not do in your life what you thought you would. But it doesn't mean that you'll have a miserable life either. You can have kids, work a job, maybe work at a church. So there are people, and I'm going to prove this to you in a minute. Then there are people that, an, a person that you could marry, and God says, well... I can accept this because you're believers. See, here's the only rule about marriage. Not, do not marry an unbeliever and do not be yoked together with an unbeliever. That's the rule of marriage. God never tells you what they look like, how tall they should be, how old they should be, what color hair they've got. That's preference. He allows you to have the preference. God is not going to tell you to marry somebody. Here's what they're going to look like whether you like it or not. Because you've got to wake up Beside that person every morning. And look, don't believe the dumb movies you see where they wake up and they're kissing all over each other. You wake up when you're married, you got nappy breath. You got the worst breath in the world. Knock, knock, knock both of you out of bread. Go brush your teeth, man, before you kiss me. Are oh, you listening to somebody? 
They said, these are things you'll learn when you get married. <laughs> but, let me, but let me go back to this and say this. So God will accept that because they are a believer. God will accept that because they love you. God will accept that because of the law of procreation, that you are to procreate the earth, and you're going to raise a Christian family. God can accept that. Are you still here? But then, there is that person that if you don't get impatient, what section am I preaching to now? You don't get impatient. You don't just go chasing, guys, this is an, express, this is an old school expression, chasing every skirt that's out there. Everything that's got two legs wearing a dress, you know, oh, I just, oh, she's, oh she's cuter. Oh, I like, oh, look at that. All right. Girls, same way, you know. Not chasing skirts, but the guys. <laughs> I just, now, in the culture we're in today, you got to correct yourself before you make certain statements. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Somebody say, I heard him say it. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to give you, the, I'm going to give you this illustration in a moment. Then there, there is the person that if you wait and you obey God and you keep praying, I want the right person. Okay? Not the perfect person. Because if you find them, you have ruined them. That went over the top of somebody's head. Let me try this section. If, you're, if you find the perfect person, you have just ruined them when you marry them because you're not perfect. And by the way, they're not either. You will find that out. Now, the reason you want the right person is they will compliment you and help you complete. Remember the word perfect? To complete the purposes of God. That's why the right person is important. Because a person may love you, may get along with you, and you can make it. But what, when you, what, do you, what happens when you say, I feel that I take a mission trip. You ain't taking no mission trip. I'm not letting you take a mission trip. See, the wrong person could stop you from doing something that would have been a good thing, good thing, an acceptable thing. So God will accept that. But then there's the perfect. Now, when I was um, a teenage minister, I learned very quick in the state of Virginia. I, I was traveling in Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and later came to Alabama uh, before I was married, a couple years before I was married. And I learned real quick back in the, we call it the old school days. Now, I'm not that old. I know you think that with the hair, but I'm not that old. Abs actually, I dyed it gray to make myself look more distinguished, but uh, anyway. And you really don't believe that, I hope. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But in the old school days, every church of God mama wanted their daughter to marry a preacher. Is anybody here with me? Can somebody help me preach? Do I have any old school folks in the house? Um, every grandmother in a Pentecostal church, and that was in the day when they wore the beehives and they pulled the hair back. If a young evangelist who was single came to the church, he was targeted. Every grandma wanted to prophesy over him. Ikalala, oh, thank you. Oh, son, I see you with a young girl. God's about to bring a young one. Oh, oh yeah, I, I think I, I, I can see what she looked like now. You know, my grandma going to prophesy over you about her, about her granddaughter. And she's giving you the, how tall she is and color hair she got, eyes. And next thing you know, here comes a girl looks just like that. Granny, you ready? <laughs> Smiling at you. And then you got invited. I did occasionally. I got invited over to people's houses to eat. And I always knew. I always knew by um, the mother, the way she acted, that she had a daughter. Always. And here she come to the dinner table. And I ate and ran. I pulled the old Joseph on him. Where's my coat? Because <laughs> when I looked at that girl, I said, ain't no way, Jose. <laughs> and uh, oh, when she was born, the doctor hit her mama in the face for having that baby girl. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just young. I'm just telling you. They probably said that about me too, okay? So it worked both ways. So anyway... Here's, here's the point I'm going to make. When I was 16 years of age, now th th this does not even, if my daughter pulled this on me, I'd have a fit. I have to tell you this. I just, I, I couldn't accept it. I was 16. The girl was 14. 
played the piano, sang. Really good girl, by the way, in the church. And I started dating her. Mistake. Never date or You know, I just don't think, I don't think you got enough sense to date when you're that age. No, I'm serious. You really, I, I mean... We did, I didn't have a youth pastor. I had no youth pastor. I had no youth leaders. Nobody instructed me. This is, this is how you did it back then, you know? And so I, I went and bought her a ring and thought I was going to marry her. And the, and the parents moved, actually moved to another state. And I think they moved to get away from me, to be honest with you. And um, never married that girl. And it, it would not have been the will of God. Now, is she saved? Yes. Does she go to church? Yes. Does she play the piano? Yes. She teaches people playing the piano. Did done that most of her life. Was she a nice person? Yes. But was it the will of God? No. Let me tell you what I, what I would have probably done. Ended up pastoring a church somewhere in Virginia. That's it. Never built VOE. Never had Warrior Fest. Never had Manifest. Never. Would I have done something for God? Yes. But what about all the things God had planned? Here's what would have happened. He would have raised up someone else to do what I was doing. This is what you have to understand. If you don't do it, and it was the plan of God for you to do it. He's not going to just rebuke you. He's going to say, well, you can move on with your life. Do the best you can. It's acceptable. It's good. But I will raise up someone else in your place. It's like when Judas hung himself. Judas messed it up. They had to do what? Replace him with a new apostle. So there's replacements that come. That's why the Bible said, let no man take your crown. Because you have assignments, but if, you let, if you're supposed to teach children's church at the ramp and you refuse to do it, guess who's going to get the reward? Not you. The person that took your place that, you, that is doing now what you were assigned to do. That's what that verse would allude to about no man take your crown. So uh, it was later, I started preaching and I, married, I, I met a, uh, a pastor's daughter. Again, played the piano. Because back in that day, I mean, everybody, you, know, you, you just knew if you were going to be a Pentecostal preacher, you had to have a piano player. Am I right? Mike and his, his had to play and they had to sing both. I mean, you, you know, automatically, you don't, that way you don't have to hire somebody to do it. You can save ministry money, praise God, by marrying somebody that can do it. And uh, she's a school teacher. She had a degree uh, already by the time she was 22 years of age. Smart girl, attractive girl, very funny. So we dated two years. And I told people like an idiot, God told me I was going to marry her. God told me, yeah, this is the girl I'm going to marry. Came to Alabama to the Church of God said offices to Pastor Joe Edwards. And I said, like an idiot, I'm just saying, you'll understand that statement in, in a moment. That's Greek for something else that I'll give to you in a minute. But, um, but I, was, I was telling people, that, and here's the reason I was telling them, because I felt like that's what the Lord had told me. I just felt like that was what the Lord told me. See? That's why you got to be careful saying God said just say, in my gut, I feel this. Or in my spirit, I kind of feel this. But leave God out of it unless you absolutely know. Wait till you're walking them down the aisle and say, yeah, this is the one God told me I was going to marry right here. That's, then, you're, then you're safe because you know it's about to happen, okay? So uh, anyway, um, I, I came to Northport, Alabama, and we were going to get married with this girl and I were going to get married in June. And uh, Northport, Alabama, in a revival that broke out, and that revival ended up going... Uh, one a week, and all of a sudden, this girl got afraid that I was going to find a southern girl. Seriously. So she and a friend drove down secretly to surprise me. And so she could play the piano and sing, and I said, well, it's good to have my fiancé here. And all the young people over there, I mean, this, this revival was breaking up. There were 50 young people been saved filled with the Holy Ghost. They looked at each other and said, fiancé? They, they, they actually, did they not do that, Pam? Fiancé? He never told us he had a fiance. We go out to eat with Perry every night. He never told us he wasn't getting married. So she got him sang and played the piano. And when she left, the, young, the youth group of 50 young people said, Nope, she ain't for you. I said, How do y'all know? We just know. There's something weird about her. She's just not for you. We all don't know her. Yeah, I'm just telling you. So guess what happens? We're at a pizza hut. Like, what was it? Three days later, two days later. And I get a call at the Pizza Hut after church one night. And they got Perry Stone here. Yep, got a call from where? I don't know, just somebody calling. Well, she called the pastor to find out where I was. The pastor said the Pizza Hut. She got the Pizza Hut number. And she tells me on the phone, I just don't know. I just don't feel about good about us getting married. We need to break up. I'm in the middle of this revival. She's telling me to break up. Okay, whatever. Go back to the seat. Hilarious. Well, what happened? That was the girl I was going to marry. Okay. You can't believe what happened. She just broke up with me. The whole table jumped. Ah, shh, shh. 
Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. I mean, I think there were people speaking in tongues running around Pizza Hut. And I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. Now, let me track with me a minute. Now, because I had that, you can't date somebody two years, break up that quick without feeling it, unless you just don't like them. And if you don't like him, it's like, yes, thank you, Jesus. But if you have had any emotional attachment, feelings, uh, you've been close to them, hanging out with them, it is a horrible, I'm just letting you know this, horrible feeling. It is a normal feeling to almost feel like a death has happened. It's normal. So don't freak out if it ever happens to you. Just say, well, Lord, you must know what you're doing, and I'm going to have to flow with this. And it will take you time to get over it. But let me tell you how fast I got over it. The revival kept going. I've told you this before. I'm going to tell you again. So one week later, third week of that revival, North Carolina Baptist, actually toward the end of the second week, going to the third week, uh, youth sitting over here at the church. I'm getting ready to preach. The choir singing. The choir singing. And I'm distressed over this breakup, you know, of course. And uh, I look over and the young people are getting with it. And, Man, that's great. And I'm, I'm getting excited because the young people have been touched. So uh, they... Uh, they get ready to have prayer. And so as they're praying, I look and I see this girl. And I'd seen her in the revival before. And we actually had gone out to eat with the youth group. And, and I, she, she was always with them. She's right on the end. I can tell you exactly what she had on. She had a, a skirt down to the knee. Oh, sanctified. Oh, hallelujah. Church of my God. Church of my God. Glory to God. She had, a, she had ruffles, a, a shirt with ruffles and a real high neck ruffles. I don't know what you call it, blouse with ruffles. And she had a jacket on, black jacket, and uh, her, her hair had hair back down to here in the back, curled at the end, brunette hair. And I'm just going to be honest. I, I'm going to have to be carnal, y'all forgive me. She was fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I know. I'm, 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 in, I'm in the pulpit trying to keep my mind on God, but I'm single. I have a right to look. Hallelujah. <laughs> that went right over y'all's head right there. Let me say it again. I was single. I had a right to look. Hallelujah. Because if you're single, you're going to look. Some of you have been married so long you forgot what it was to look. Okay, let's try that again. And I'm thinking, well, that's, wow, what a beautiful, and I hear the Lord, I hear the Lord say, that's the girl you're going to marry. I heard it. I knew his voice. I've been praying all day. I heard it. And I'm thinking, that's the devil trying to distract me from this church service. So I start, I start this, I bind this in the name of Jesus. I cast down this imagination in the name of Jesus. I did, I, I promise. Glory to God, I've come against this God. I want my mind cleared. I'm not going to have any distraction. And so they get up and pray, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, scanning, just praying like this. And I hear the Lord say, that's the girl you were married. And I'm telling you, this happened to me. The, when he said it the second time, it went from my head to my gut. Do you know what that feeling's like? Rhema word quickened word and I said oh Lord so I did the right I did the Bible thing I, I closed one eye and opened the other I watched and prayed while everybody's praying I'm praying and watching at the same time <laughs> weird part weird part I mean the, the, the you know the biggest thing you could do in my day was hold hands you understand what I'm saying you could hold hands under the table you could hold hands in the car and so I remember we would go out to eat and I would get there late because of praying in the altars. And all the young, we're talking about 20 to 40 young people. And they used to hate to see us coming at 10 o'clock at night in these restaurants. And I remember that every time I went to get a seat, either I got there and she arrived late. And there was always an empty seat, always beside me. Or she was there and there was an empty one. Wasn't that right? Did you plan it that way? You all must have planned it that way. I don't. She just said no. She just shook her head no. Can you believe that? She shook her head no. But I always sat beside her. So, it, you know, I could tell there was something there. I never said, oh, God told me. Man, that's the worst way to scare somebody off is tell them God just to say, you go, don't over, don't do it. <laughs> At the ramp, use wisdom, wait. Let months go by, weeks go by. Get to know people. Do not go, I was praying and all the God told me, <coughs> you ain't going to get married. <laughs> no, Bubba, go back home. <laughs> ain't getting married, Bubba. Nope. <laughs> you ever ask yourself why am I attracted to Bozo you know what I'm saying it's like why can't I get that so but I'm like I'm like then I realized it, we had dated what two 
called. We didn't date. We went on one date in two years. One date in two years. Because I'm traveling all over the place. I knew, I knew as sure as the world I was going to marry her. Now let me ask, explain this to you why God chose her. I don't think I've said this much ever since we've been married. Oh, her, Pam's eyes went. <clears throat> Watch this because this is really good for a lot of you here. Because we're talking about trying to find the mind of God. Trying to find what is his complete will. This is why she was so complete for me. Number one, she's from a divorced home. You say, what does that have to do with anything? I was going to take her away from her family in Alabama. She would be on the road with me in one point, 16 services, 16 weeks every night preaching somewhere without a break. Because she was not tied to her mama, she was not tied to her dad, she loved her sisters, she didn't have to go home and see mama all the time. I could take her on the road three months and she's happy with me because she doesn't have to go see mama. Her mom and dad are divorced. Are you listening to me? Number two, when I... She went to get a job at the University of Alabama, and they never called her back. And the thing that she liked to do was bookkeeping. Guess who I needed? Guess what I needed in my ministry? A bookkeeper. So she knew how to do all of that, and I didn't realize that I needed a bookkeeper because my mama was my bookkeeper. But when you're going to get married, mama ain't going to be at your bookkeeper no more because you're going to move. So she could do the books. Number three, I had an outreach ministry of tapes. She would run, she literally would run the service tapes, type up the labels in the back. After I got through preaching, she'd get the master, type up the labels, make the cassette masters, and we would actually, I would watch her by herself, duplicate the tapes, sell the tapes, type out the tapes, and run the whole table, sometimes with no help at all. And took care of all that. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. God knew I did not need another preacher to compete with. The girl that I was going to marry before Pam said to me, before you preach, I will do two songs every night. And I will do this because I have a ministry. And that's what started this whole journey of maybe this isn't right. Pam had no expect expectations, doesn't like getting up in front of people, doesn't care about giving a word because she just receives the word and she'll tell you in private what God tells her. And was exactly, woo, exactly what I needed to complete what I needed in every aspect of my ministry. And we've been married 39 years to God be the glory. Right? So watch this. Let's take that word perfect again. Just look at it one more time. Perfect will of God is the root, teleon or teleos. It depends on what form the verb it's used in. But the root is to complete. What is the good, acceptable, and complete, fulfilled will of God? Your person, I don't know why I'm on this. This is where I guess we're supposed to go. But the person that you are supposed to be with the rest of your life is called help meet, help meet, help meet in Genesis. Are you ready for what that word means in Hebrew? That word means an opposing opposite. <laughs> Pam went, <laughs> she laughed. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Oh, we get along so great. We love the same things. We like the same people. We like, 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 like. I cannot tell you that, well, I'm going to just say it outright. Jensen and Sharice Franklin, uh, when we knew Randy and Paula White, Karen and Rick, every couple we have ever known are opposite of each other. Sharice will ride the, the roller coaster upside down. Jensen don't want to get on it. Cherie will tell you what she thinks, and Jensen will say, Cherise, come on, calm down. You're embarrassing me. Okay? I'm the talker. Pam's a listener. Me and Karen will go out to eat with Rick. 
and you know, uh, Pam, uh, I said, Pam and I, Karen and Rick, will go out to eat. All right, this is a true story, and they know what I'm about to say. Me and Karen preached to each other the entire time. <laughs> the, the entire time. They don't get a word in. Rick, if, I, if I'm telling the truth, raise your hand, because they think I'm joking. Everybody, everybody, everybody knows it's true. <laughs> so I'm not giving a secret away. And Rick and Pam hardly get a word in. All right? I'm the talker. Pam is the listener. Karen's the talker. Rick's the listener. Now watch this. I am the preacher. She's the business lady. Karen is the minister. Rick's the businessman. It's called balance. Watch this though. Help meet Genesis for God made Adam a helpmeet who was Eve. It is an opposing opposite. It means that what they do is they, where you are weak, they are strong. Where you are strong, they are weak. And so when she needs something, encouragement, I can give her an encouragement. But when I need it, she can give that encouragement to me from another direction. The good the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Now, I'm going to say this to you. Jesus said this statement. And my, by, by the way, my computer died, just like I said Murphy's Law. Okay, I knew, I knew it was going to happen. But Jesus makes this statement in the Lord's Prayer. He says, pray this prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is where? Have you, have you ever thought about that verse? What in heaven needs to be done that's God's will? He's already made the new Jerusalem. It already has streets of gold. Paradise already exists. The dead in Christ that have died in the Lord, their soul and spirit is already there. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The Lamb's book of life is there with our name in it. How do you figure the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven? Is it like up in heaven they're saying, oh, wait a minute, oh, that's not the will of God. Change the color of that gate. Hold on, hold on. You put blue up, blue up. No, 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 no. This is the marriage supper. We've got to do the will of God. No, the will of God has already been set and established in heaven. And I can prove it to you by this verse that Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. God already had the will revealed in heaven thousands of years before the Lamb, Jesus, ever came to the earth. But what had to happen was Jesus had to come and enact on earth what God had already planned in heaven. God knew the time would come that it might be hard for him to follow through with his own death. So he said, all right, I'll give you an option. Here's your option. You want out of it? I got 12 legions of angels. I'll stop it. And all you've got to do is open your mouth. But Jesus stands before them. And it says in Isaiah 53, like a lamb before the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. Why do you think he did not open his mouth? Because he knew if he opened his mouth the wrong way at the wrong time, he could release those angels. The world would have been destroyed. The plan of redemption would have been totally, completely done away with. So he had to pray, God, I know what your will is in heaven, but help me to enact what the will of God is on the earth. Every day of your life, you should pray, God, whatever the plan, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house, whatever the plan of God is in the heavens, whatever you've got settled in the heavens, forever, oh God, thy word is settled in heaven, whatever it is, then I want you to manifest it by vision, revelation, understanding, or by my inner feeling by the peace that I someone said Perry how do you always know when you're in God's will I'm going to give you the ultimate word it's called peace you can have peace of God peace from God peace with God all three of those come through different methods conviction when you conv you're convicted and you repent of your sin you get one level of that peace when you follow through with God's purpose you get another level of that peace and when you are struggling with a crisis and a situation and a storm and God gives you a peace that passes all understanding
money. He'll give you another level of that peace. There's three levels of peace that comes with God. But this is how you know the will of God. It doesn't I feel the mabahariste kateza. It doesn't matter what the situation nor the circumstance looks like when you can lay back and hell's breaking loose and nothing is going good and you ain't got money to pay the bill and you don't even have money to stay at the ramp and you don't even know what in the world's going on but somewhere down on the inside of your innermost being I call it the gut nerve the gut feeling you can lay back in your head on the pillow at night and you can say you know what God's got it all worked out God has got it all covered all I got to do is go with the flow and every day when I get up say Lord your will be done today and tomorrow God your will be done today and the next day God your will be done today the will of God is not like, 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 like saying let's go out there 20 years in the future and see where we'll be can I tell you and no God is not going to tell you where you're going to be 20 years from now because here's the reason why you would try to shorten the 20 years and make it three If God showed you a missions in Africa and you're going to be over this great missions, you know what you'd do? You'd be on the internet, missions in Africa, missions in Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, and you'd be trying to put your resume in and you're not even ready. I mean, you got to go down there and eat monkey meat and lizard and you can't even eat a T-bone steak from a dead cow. Come on. And many times, can I say this to you? Can I tell you this about the will of God having been there? Many times you will have an advanced knowledge called the word of knowledge or word of wisdom that's going to come through the Lord to help you to see a part, just a, just a, just a piece of the puzzle, just enough to keep you believing, just enough to hold you on, just, just enough. He won't give you the whole thing, but he'll give you enough to cause you to hold on. And here's the reason he does it. And I'm going to tell you something. Can I tell you this? And it drives me crazy. It really does. The reason he does it is one verse. You walk by faith. And not by sight. Mm hmm. Okay, let me show you something. I'm, I'm, there's two ways I could go. I want to make sure I go the right direction here. Will of God. <laughs> when I was 16 years of age, I love, first of all, I love sports. I really wanted to play sports more than anything else, but that didn't work out, didn't pan out. So I took architecture drawing for four years in high school. I already talked to my uncle in Ohio. To, he, was a, he built bridges and built all kinds of construction things. About maybe coming up and mentoring under him and then going further into that. So I was artsy. I liked art. I, liked create, I loved creativity. And I decided one night I was listening to my dad. Can I tell the story? I was listening to my dad tell stories of miracles in West Virginia that he saw as a boy. As a young, I say a boy, a teenager. I'm talking about incredible miracles. And I looked at these men with me. They were men. One divorced, two were still married. And I said, how come we don't have these miracles? What's the deal with us? We didn't have a prayer meeting. I said, let's go pray. Went to the church next door to pray starting at 11 o'clock and left at 3.30 in the morning. I mean, we prayed. I had never, I had never prayed that long in my life. But I got, it's somewhere around 2 o'clock to 2.30. I got into a zone I did not know exist. My daddy told me, if you will stay in prayer and if you can focus to get your mind clear after about an hour, if you will not get up and you will stay in prayer and you will go from glory to glory, you'll go up Jacob's ladder. You will go into a realm where you'll be in the presence of God and you'll go from the presence of God to a divine heavenly presence. Then you'll go into a, like a third heaven. Now, I know these are terms you may not understand. Like a third heaven level to where you are actually in the throne room itself. My daddy, look, I'm going to tell you something I don't like to tell too often because people make fun of it. But my dad was with a man in West Virginia. I just visited that church. In fact, Jake and I, that used to be here, Jake and I went up. You can ask Jake about it. We visited the church where my dad had this happen, and the benches are still in this old church. The windows are knocked out, and the, the bench. Man, I felt the Holy Ghost when I stood there. That bench where dad was at. And my dad, I said, Jake, look at that floor right there. We're looking in the window, broken window. See that floor? That's where my daddy was. And my dad started praying at 7 o'clock. Now, he wasn't praying loud to disturb, but they're having church, and he's laying on the floor praying. Eight o'clock, he's praying. Nine o'clock, church is over. And he heard the pastor say, someone stay with Brother Freddie, please. I don't want to disturb him. He, he's really in the spirit right now. And my dad's prayed till nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And Al Collins told my dad, told him about 1130, 
you started singing in tongues. What happened to you? And dad was, when he come out of this, he come out about midnight. He said, I saw the edge of the new Jerusalem. He said, I, I, he said, I prayed and I'd go higher and higher and I broke into a veil. <laughs> a veil of the spirit. And I saw the edge of the city. He said, I know you did. He said, because your face started disappearing, Fred. And I, it scared me. And I ran over here and was in the corner just shaking and praying. He said, there was a glory that came on you. He said, You're, you physically were disappearing. Now, this man was a great man of God. He later died. He later died. And when my dad got called to preach, and, I, and, I, and I, again, I hate to even tell this because people think it's weird but when my dad got called to preach, he was about to go into the Korean War. We're talking, now we're talking about the will of God here, right? We're talking about praying. So he was going to go into the Korean War, and he already met with the draft board and said, I will go in as a medic. They said, well, you're going to have to have training for that. He said, well, whatever, I'll serve my country anyway. But he said, I'm a minister. And, and he said, for me to go into a battle and to have to shoot someone, I don't think I can do it, but I will serve the country. Tell me what to do on the battlefield if I have to or drive trucks or anything. So they met with my dad, okay, and they gave him a paper. I still have that paper somewhere, a little card that was 1A or something. I don't remember how they did it back then, but they had a card, and they said, now you hold on to this because if we call you, we'll need this card. All right, so now he's going up into a little cabin to pray. And I'm telling you, I can hardly tell this to this day, and my dad couldn't tell it without crying. It would take him 10 minutes to get through it if he was telling it right here. He had a white cane back chair, and it was a cabin no bigger than this little room right here. It had a table, chair, a little lantern in it, and they, had, they, they carried some canteens of water. They didn't have bottled water back then. No, no uh, electronic devices were up there, of course, and they had their Bible. And he was outside, and he had that white cane back chair leaned up against the, uh, the wall near the door. And all of a sudden, a hand came through the back of the inside of the house, through the wall and grabbed him on the shoulder. And when it did, he collapsed with his head on his Bible and the chair shoved forward. And he said, oh my Lord, I have died. And then he described of coming out of his body like taking a glove and pulling it off the hand. And he came out of the top of his head. His spirit and soul came out of the top of his head. And he looked back and saw his body and said, well, I've had a heart attack. I've had a heart attack. And then all of a sudden, he felt a pressure come. He said it wasn't painful, but you could feel it. And it was like a, a giant vacuum cleaner had come over him. And it started sucking him up into the atmosphere. He went through the top of trees. And he said, next thing I knew, I am in a fetal position like this. And I'm <laughs> moving so fast that I can't even tell you how fast. And I'm not even able to open my eyes. And he said, in a bit, it stopped. And I'm standing on nothing in a sapphire heaven. It's the most beautiful sapphire. He said, everything above you is sapphire. Around you is sapphire. Under your feet is sapphire. He said, it's like a, a massive vacuum of nothing but sapphire color. And if dad didn't know this, but the Bible says God sits on a sapphire throne. Read the book of Ezekiel. Sapphire. Blue. Beautiful blue. And dad said... He was struggling about what to do about this war thing. And in the distance, he saw a silver light coming. Now, we're talking about the will of God here, right? We're talking about finding the will of God. And it got as big as a, about a silver dollar. He held his hand out when he would do it that big. And he said, all of a sudden, that light opened. And my friend who saw me pray in that church who died of brain tumor cancer a few weeks later. Al Collins steps out of that light. And I, I said, I said, Al, Al, it's Fred. Never answered him. Never responded to a thing dad said. D didn't talk to him. He held his hand up out of that light. said, Fred, God says you're called to preach. Put his hand down. Dad tried to communicate. It's like Al didn't hear him. Fred, God sent me to tell you, go back. You have to preach. And then Al stepped back in that light, and Dad was trying to, Al, where are you? Where, where am I at? What, what? Dad said, I knew it was heaven somewhere. And that light went back 
And when it went back and disappeared, he started going into a vacuum below his feet. <laughs> Again, fetal position. Ended up coming through trees, could see his spirit and so go through trees. Remember, Jesus could go through doors. Don't think that's strange with the resurrected body. He wouldn't have a resurrected body, but it was a soul and spirit. And he came back into his body. And he said, when I came back into my body, it came in with a jerk. I heard my heart just like, a, like my heart, like a fear, almost like when you get an adre adrenal surge. His heart jerked. And he said, all of a sudden, every hair on my body was standing up. Every hair, back of my neck, my arms. And I am shaking. And the draft board never called him. And when he finally went to see him, I found this out from dad later. He said, I finally got so concerned. I knew I was called to preach. And I went back and told him, he said, gentlemen, he said, I I'm called to the ministry. But again, if you need me, he said, preacher, we should have contacted you because we have been in, we have agreed. Now, these were, this is back when men prayed. <laughs> but we think there's so many young men going to war. There's so many mamas in these mountains that are losing their boys. We need a young... <laughs> We need a young man your age to pray for him and encourage him. So we want you to stay. And my dad was supposed to go into the Korean War. And the draft board told him not to go. Bartley, West Virginia. Now why? Why? He's an old man and he's in his 70s. He's gray-headed. He's dying on me. My dad. I said, Dad, tell me about some things that you know God did in your life and why he did it. And he talks about the draft board. And he says, if I'd have gone to war, I'd have never met your mother. I met her in a revival. If I'd have gone to war and never met your mother, you would have never been born. If you'd have never been born, your children would have never been born. If you'd have never been born, there's a couple million souls that would have never been saved. The second experience that he had when he was a young man was he was taken. Dad, my dad actually went to heaven about three different times. And it was all through prayer. It was all through fasting and prayer. That's how it happened. And on this one occasion, he was somewhere in the heavenlies. And he said this was very strange because he says there was this beautiful library. And he was able to go into this library. And there was books. He said, Perry, the books were so large. They were like this wide. They were like this tall. It took two hands to handle them. And he said, I saw a book called The Prophecies of Jesus. And he said, when I saw the book, The Prophecies of Jesus, I went to take the one because I was intrigued by prophecy. And God said, that's not for you. Stay with me there. And he looked to the, beside it, and there's one called The Mighty Acts and Words of Jesus. And he said, I pulled that book out, and when I opened it, Perry... He said it was like black, most beautiful black and white pictures of every miracle Jesus did, even the ones that's not in the Bible. When he went to bless the kids, there were so many kids, he touched his disciples' hands and sent them out among the crowd. He said, I saw the picture. And it told me, he said, I could read it in my understanding. It told me everything he was doing. He said, there are miracles he did of raising dead kids and dead people that's not even. And what does John say? John said, if, if, if we'd have put all the miracles in, even the world's books couldn't contain what he did. And he says, We're gonna, you're going to get to heaven. And you're going to actually get to go to a library. So near death again. He was a, he was a few months from dying. I said, Dad, tell me about the book again. Tell me about the book. If you know our ministry, you'll understand this. And he said to me, he said, son, my ministry was about miracles, and it was. It was the works of Jesus. My dad, all he preached was Jesus in the New Testament, and he'd have miracles. He'd have 16 people healed of cancer. But my ministry turned into prophecy. And he said to me, I remember him crying. And Micah, he said, the book in heaven that had the secrets in it was not for me. 
He pointed at bony finger. He said, it was for you, son. Because God's going to give you and has given you unlocking the things that nobody in our generation ever saw. Nobody growing up in my generation ever saw the things you're preaching. Your own granddad said to me, how does Perry get this stuff? It's in the book. And why, how did we miss it for 50 years? The will of God will never take you where the grace of God can't keep you. And the will of God will never take you. Now, let me give you this word. This is, this is I'm going to wrap this up. I mean, there's a hundred ways I could go, but I got to wrap it up somewhere. I got to put a caboose on it. Listen to me carefully. There are many of you here who struggle of what you're going to do when you leave the ramp. Because you say, I don't see a particular door opening. How am I going to use what I have learned practically? What does my future hold? And I want you to remember this, this word. The commandments of God are not grievous. It's in the book. Let me say it again. The commandments of God are not grievous. Now, he just reminded me. Thank you, Lord. This was in my notes. I, I totally forgot about it. Thank you, Lord. Have you ever read that verse in Psalms that says, Delight yourself in the Lord? Now, stay with me on this one. This, this is the main thing I need to tell you. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. In the English language... What does that say by the way we interpret it? Let me say it again. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If I retranslate that to how most of us take it, it goes like this. If you love God with all your heart and seek him first, anything you want, God's going to give it to you. Desires of your heart. Now, how do you think that if you look at it, that's what it's saying? Would you like for me to tell you what it's actually saying? This is going to help. This is going to help everybody in this place if you'll remember this. Girl comes up to me and I said, she said, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I said, what do you want to do? I want to do what God wants me to do. She said, I said, no, no, that's not my question. What do you want to do? I want to be a missions nurse so bad that I dream about it. I said, that's what you're going to do. She said, but is it the will of God? I said, stop. Who do you think put that in your heart? Who put it there? That verse is, can actually be translated, if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will plant in you desires that He will help you fulfill. You tracking with me? When I first preached, I was not much of a preacher. I was horrible. I couldn't even pronounce most of the words in the Bible. But I knew I was called to preach. You couldn't talk me out of it. Nobody else could talk me out of it. My dad was the pastor. He tried to talk me out of it. But I knew I was called to preach. So when you know you're called to preach, guess what you're going to do? You're going to preach. I'll preach in the nursing home. I'd preach on the street corner. I'd preach and testify. I'd get up and just get testify and quote a few scriptures just so I could get up and say I preached. But I'm going to tell you something who put it in my heart? Who put it in my heart to do a little magazine that was nothing but a flyer and a folder with misspelled words that now has become a 38-page full-color magazine? Who put it in my heart? Who put it in my heart at age 18 to have a seven-point outreach plan when I didn't even have seven outreaches and I hadn't even preached in two states? They used to say, who does Perry Stone think he is? Or Roberts. And one guy saw my revival poster and said, this is he of whom Billy Graham said, who is this? I got mocked. I got rejected. I got made fun of. But let me tell you, when you're on an assignment and you had a prayer meeting with God and you know God spoke to your spirit, then can't nobody talk you out of what God told you to do. I got news for somebody. They can't talk you out of it. They can't talk you down. 
I went to preach to, I feel the Holy Ghost on me right now. I went to preach it down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the LSU students came out, by two, two to three hundred of them. And they had a ministry there by Rust, brother, with Brother Rusty Domain, and so they came to hear me preach. There were two young men that were, called, that, that, that I'm going I'm to give their names. One was John Sibling. One was a guy named Stovall. They were students at LSU. I'm telling you, they were wild as bucks. We'd get banners and run around that church. We'd go lay hands on people, people falling out, rolling around, speaking in tongues. And I went to that church every year for four years straight. One of them, one of them, their dad was a lawyer. And when he said to his dad, I'm called to preach, his dad had a fit. I mean, his dad went crazy. How can you preach? What is in preaching? You need to do something with your life. Another one's dad was a professor at LSU that actually had invented some things and was very famous. He's saying to his son, what are you doing? I didn't send you to school to go be a preacher. You see, but those boys knew that they were called to preach. They knew that God had a plan. I bought Stovall his very first pulpit in Nashville, Tennessee when he didn't have but a handful of people coming. I'm talking you can count it on one hand. Stovall now has not only one campus but campus is all over the place and has one of the great ministries uh, over in the Memphis area I think it is. I don't even remember where it is now. Was it Memphis? I said Nashville. Over in Memphis. Now let me tell you about the other one and that's John Sibling. Sibling has that one in Tennessee. But let me tell you about Jacksonville, Florida. Let me tell you about Stovall. I, I remember when Stovall had me come in when he was running about 300. Stovall now has 15,000 to 20,000 members and has one of the greatest churches on the east coast of the United States. Now I do think now their dads are rather proud of them that they went ahead and obeyed the Lord. I'm trying to tell you something. It's not easy to follow the will of God. It is not easy to get on a plane and go through customs to go preach and have to get half sick when you're on the mission field. It is not easy like I have done my entire life of taking six or seven times a weekend and preaching and coming back and working on Monday through Friday. It is not easy to pastor people when they're fickle and they're with you one day and they leave you the next. I've dealt with that as well. But I'm going to tell you something. There is a purpose of God. There is a completed purpose. There is something. You don't have to know about it right now. You don't have to have the details right now. God Almighty, somebody help me praise the Lord in this house. Would you help me praise him in the house? Now I can pick up that little book. I wish I brought one with me. First book I ever printed called Precious Promises for Believers. I took a drum set like this drum set here and gave it to a printer so that I could print my first book because I didn't have enough money to even pay for a book. Sold that book for a dollar a copy. Found one the other day that I still have. And I want to tell you, I printed 500 copies. Sold those. Printed some more of those. Sold those. Went and wrote another book. Sold it for a dollar a copy. That started, I have printed 80, written 80 books, including several bestsellers and several that have won awards and that's pretty good for a kid that flunked English and made D's and E's in English and had to go to summer school and hated the English language and told my mama I'm not going to speak neither am I going to write I'm going to do something different so I don't need to learn grammar English or anything else but God has proofreaders but God has computers that can help you do it hallelujah does anybody hear what I'm talking about you're looking at somebody I feel the Lord in the house you're looking at somebody that a church of God preacher looked at me, had my same last name, wasn't related to me when I was 18 and said, if you don't go to Lee College, you're not going to make it and you're going to fall flat on your face. Guess what? He said, I was going to blow over. I'd like to see him again if he's still living and tell him I blew over the entire world on television. I have blown over 450 states of the United States. I've blown over seven foreign nations. I've had millions of people saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost around the world. No, I didn't make it. Go God made it. I wasn't, hey, I was just a vessel. I was willing to say, take me, do something with me. Hallelujah. You better help me shout one time. Somebody better help me shout one time. So you're not ready when you think you are, but get ready. That's what you're here for. You're here to prepare. It is not, God is not. How much time do I have? Give me five minutes. Do I, am, I, am I gone over, Rick? Am I going too long? Y'all, yeah, wait. Rick said way over. I don't have a clock up here. Y'all made a mistake when I come not putting a clock up, please. Because I have no, I lose track of time. <laughs> but, but, 
but I want, I want to get this. I got to just get this point to you. I got to get this into your spirit so you'll remember it. Huh. Huh. I was thinking one day, when I went to high school, I hated school. I hated, hated school. Hated. I, I, I'm telling you. Seventh grade through 12th, forget it. My senior class is crying. They're, they're, they've thrown their caps in the air. And I'm, yes, <laughs> I'm out of here. Glory. I just didn't like it. I was persecuted the whole time I was in school because of being a Christian. I got to thinking the other day, Pam, I've had, I can name four friends that I had in high, senior high school, just four. Couldn't get a date from a girl. First of all, wouldn't date most of them anyway because they weren't saved. And the ones that were hit it. You never know it. But <laughs> it's funny. I was thinking the other day about I only had four friends. But I could take my whole senior class and line them up in a room and guarantee you that Perry Stone to this day has more friends than all of them put together. All because I did the will of God. Millions of people stand with us. Millions of people back us up. Millions of people watch our programs. I'm not saying that boasting. I'm just telling you that if you'd have told me at age 18 that that was going to happen, I laughed. And so would everybody else that knew me. I can remember when making a car payment was hard. I can remember not getting enough offering at a church to pay my fuel home. I can remember giving the offering back to the church because they were about to shut the doors down and didn't have enough money to pay their rent, and I got nothing. Oh, I tell you the stories. You can see things like they are now, but I can tell you the stories. But now it's common to write a check out for $1.5 million. I couldn't even count to $1.5 million when I was 18. Rick's on my board. Rick understands. My budget's $14, $15 million a year. And here's the cool part. We don't ask for people to send us money. We don't send donor letters asking for money. We don't beg people for help. <laughs> Y'all ain't hearing me. You know why? Because we did the will of God. God gave me the name Voice of Evangelism. I had it since I was 18. God gave the seven point average. Had it since I was 18. God built the Omega Center International. God had a multi-millionaire pay for it. I don't know if y'all understand this. Let me just say this to the ramp. To the ramp that now has Ramp Cleveland. Do you understand that if I would have built that building and went to the bank loan, the bank payment would be $60,000 a month on that building. Karen Wheaton could have never afforded to take that building over. Nobody could have afforded to take that building over. And if I would have wanted to give it up for my health or for any other reason, what would we have done with it? It would have been sold to the city to a convention center. God did not pay for that building to sell it to the city for a convention center. And one lawyer in the city said, I'll get rid of Perry Stone and see to it that I'll own that that building. I said, over my dead body you'll own it. You're not going to own it because God owns it. You're not going to own it because God paid for it. And you see God paid for that building knowing that there would be no pressure or no debt on the ramp trying to make a mortgage payment on it. You all really need to shout a revelation to the heavens right now. I'm saying God's got this thing. God Almighty. God's got this thing from beginning to end. Now, who's praying for, who's praying, who's praying, and I mean this sincerely, we all are, but I'm telling you, there's some folks that's been praying very intently, and I'm going to say it this way because it's coming by this word of knowledge. You've been very concerned. You're not one of those that go on tell everybody and you know how you feel, you know, but you are very concerned about the will of the Lord. You're very concerned that you don't want to miss it, and you have absolutely no clue. You, you see visions, you, you dream dreams, you dream dreams of what you would like to do, but you really have no clue what God has for you. That's who I'm here for right now. Stand up. Stand up. It's not, you don't have to be embarrassed about this. I've been there. God gives you the desires of your heart. Okay, stay stand. Let me talk. Let me just speak to your spirit. Close your eyes. Let me just speak to your spirit for a minute. Number one, do not be confused 
with what you feel like you want to do and you feel like God put it in your heart, flow with it. If you are confident that you know in your spirit where your gift is, if you're confident that you know what is in your heart, do you love poor people? Do you love hurting people? Do you love kids that are addicted? You want to see them live? What do you love music? Are you arts? What is it? Okay. Whatever is in there, you have been pursuing God. It's there because of him. I want you to understand that point one. So you don't have to go looking of, am I going to miss it? If I, if I feel this and go, there, am I going to, you're not going to miss it because God gives you the desire that's in your heart. That's point one. Point two is what you have to pray is not God let your will be done because your, his will will be done. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things are added. There is automatic flow that comes. The footsteps of a good person are what? Ordered. See, the flow is going to automatically come. You can't force it. You can't make it. You can't get the right connections. You can't open the door. God says, I have the key of David. I open the door that no man can open and I'll shut the door. So God controls the door. So here's what you've got to pray. And this is the word for you. It's, I've, come, I've came all the way here to Alabama to give you this because this is going to help somebody. You've got to pray, God, this is what I feel. I'm going to learn. That's the third thing. You've got to learn everything you can about that subject. If I'm going to preach prophecy, I've got to learn everything there is about prophecy. If I'm going to be a faith preacher, I want to know the faith books. I want to read the Smith Wigglesworth book. If I want to know about the gifts of the Spirit, I'm going to find these people that have operated in the gifts. Whatever it is, not just the curriculum you're under right now, but whatever it is that you need to pursue, you need to learn everything from everybody that you know why you're here. Spend extra time. And study their testimony. Not that it's going to happen to you the same way it happened to them. But it builds your faith and it keeps you focused on where you want to go. Let not the disappointments of your life and let not the disappointments of your heart define you at this moment, says the Lord. When I formed you, when I called you, I took into consideration your weaknesses. I took into consideration your failures. I took into consideration your struggles. I knew these things, but I still called you. Huh? I knew these things, and I still loved you. I knew these things. And I still ordained you to do the work for me. Therefore, do not look at the past. For you can never move forward. You can never move into the light when you stay in the dark. You can never move forward by looking into the dark of the past. Trust the Lord your God with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. Quit reasoning. Quit trying to figure it out. Quit trying to make it happen and allow Him to do it His way and in His time. For as was said, you think you're ready, but there is more preparation. For there are people around you. There are people you have not yet met that you must connect with, but I am preparing them. They are not yet ready. It's a time of preparation. It's a time to spend in the presence of God. It's a time to get intimate with Him, to learn how to hear His voice in the little things. You will need this to know how to function and hear the still small voice of the Lord. Whew. Let's lift our hands together, everybody. Let's lift our hands. Let's praise the Lord out loud. Would you praise Him out loud, everybody? Oh, Oh, 
Oh, Spirit of the living God today. I want you to minister, Lord, to these precious ones that are here. Oh, God, you put this in their heart. You put it inside of their spirit. What they feel, it's coming from you, Lord. It's not just them. It's not just their own desire. They've sought you. And I just pray, Father, for peace, 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 peace. Lift your hands and I want to pray peace over you. Father, right now, I'm asking you to send perfect peace. They will know, they will know the direction of the Lord. They will know the mind of the Lord. They will know what to do when the time comes because they will have peace. I rebuke the spirit of confusion in the name of Jesus. I rebuke the spirit of confusion in the name of Jesus. Learn everything you can. Learn everything you can about whatever it is that's in your heart. Don't let the enemy steal the dream that you have that looks so large and so big that you don't know how it would ever happen. Every day say, Father God, the doors that you would have open, open them. And Father, the doors that you would close have them close in the name of the Lord Jesus in the name of the Lord Jesus right now Father by the power of the Holy Ghost by the anointing of God I pray let the Spirit of God have His way let the anointing of God break the yoke that would try to tie them down and hinder them from the peace I pray peace of God over you in Jesus' name, that your mind will be relieved. Now, tonight you will sleep. Tonight you will rest. Tonight you will have peace. From this moment on, in the name of Jesus, you will not over-rationalize. You will not over-reason. Rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. The footsteps of a good person will be ordered of the Lord. He knows the timing. When he's ready for it, when he's ready for it, he knows you're ready for it. It's going to happen. Now, everybody stand to your feet and raise your hands and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost together. Oh, la, 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 ma, ma, ma. Micah, come on up here, buddy. Would you, would you put your hands up and just pray in the Spirit of God, everybody? Let's pray. You pray the will of God when you do that. Ma, 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 There's one more scripture, and then I want to turn it over, but look this way. And, and this was in the notes, too. This is coming back to this is the last thing I was going to share with you. Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit Himself helpeth our infirmities. Helpeth Greek means to take hold of together with you and him together not him outside of you not you outside of him together for we know not what we should pray for as we should but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered then he talks about who knows the mind of man save the spirit of man mind of the spirit of God save the spirit of God watch this verse for we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose my entire life I've heard that quoted by itself. You cannot quote that verse by itself without taking the two verses before. It's context. And I'm going to give you the bottom line. Read Romans 8 when you get home, like 26, 27, 28, and you'll see it. It's really powerful. If you pray in the Spirit, watch this. This is the, this is the context. If you will pray in the Spirit, which is the prayer language or speaking in tongues, if you will pray in the Spirit within your heart to seek the will of God, watch this now, then all things will work together for good. How many times have we just said, folks, don't worry about it. All things are going to work together. That's not what it says. You've got to go back to what Paul's saying. When you pray in the Spirit, you pray the will of God. When you pray in the Spirit, you pray the mind of God. So if you pray in the Spirit, what happens? Then after you've prayed in the Spirit, right, you know all things are going to work together. So your real key here and I, I practiced this my whole life, 46 years, is to pray excessively in the Holy Spirit. And then He will open up the, the, the will of God for you. It's going to happen. Give the Lord praise, everybody. Amen.